Okay, we'll follow our um, typical uh, uh, pattern. So interactive meeting, uh, we don't have a huge crowd today, so uh, feel, yeah, feel free to, to speak out as you have something. And uh, yeah, so we go from there. Uh, so we'll, we'll follow a normal pattern. We'll start out with a, a chance for Sylvia, a, a win of the month. And, and today I learned uh, we have a whole bunch of announcements and uh, yeah, various calls for participation and, and so on. Uh, to, to run through. And then for our topic of the day, uh, Laurie will walk us through some tips on how to write a good ticket. Then a, a quick look at what's coming up. So starting out, uh, win of the month. So this is a, a opportunity to show off an achievement or shout out someone else's achievement. Um, and they can be you know, big things or small things. Solved a bug through to got something published in Nature. Uh, some things might be a candidate for a um, high impact scientific achievement award or an innovative uh, use of high performance computing award. Anybody like to kick us off with something they've uh, something they've seen or achieved recently? One of those cases where you should have sit down and, and done the thinking, what, a, what have I seen or achieved recently? <laughs> Sometimes you get a bit of a, a slow month. How about the flip side of it? Today I learned. Um, so, yeah, not everything works on the first shot. Um, but, kind of, you know, that's how you learn stuff. When you discovered something either that they tripped up on or it doesn't even have to be tripped up on just uh you yeah, stumbled across something that's uh you know valuable and a good tip In a discussion going on in a thread here, there's been some uh, chat about uh, interesting new languages. And uh, I don't know if it's so much a case of uh, something I learned, but uh, something that seems well worth looking into is there's this, there's this like a collection of, of relatively new, new languages that are you know, programming languages that are building up Steam. Um, so, so Rust, which does sort of you know, system level stuff, has got a whole new model for dealing with memory. Uh, seems seems kind of uh, you know, well worth looking into and it's had some, some big strides. Um, something I've been following a little bit lately is the Julia language. And I think yeah, we have uh, uh, yeah, some support for that at NERSC and I think a handful of users at least that are using it, which kind of, shaping up, I think, to be a, a good potential eventual replacement for Python. It sort of, yeah, can do a lot of the things that Python is good at. It also is good at, and it's a bit more of a, a you know, a maintainable language um, and, and a faster language as well in terms of um, runtime. And that's a, yeah, another kind of yeah, new approach to doing things. Uh, and the other one that I keep on hearing is worth looking into is Go. Although I think that's that's less in the uh, high performance computing field. Will I saw you put a hand up? Oh yeah, I wanted to mention Go, but you already mentioned that, and uh, I will like yeah. to also mention D, which is recently supported in GCC. D. Now I think I've heard of D, but I don't know anything about it. What what type of language is it? I don't know anything about it as well, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, uh, uh, we might have a, a slightly uh, quiet session today, but that's okay. Let's uh, go on. What we uh, definitely have a lot of is announcements and calls for participation. So 
uh, something that uh, is coming up um, next month, pretty important. Uh, we have the annual NUG meeting. And so this year we're going to do it as a, a fully virtual event. And we're going to spread it over three days so that it's not you know, a, a huge block of Zoom, but we'll use uh, a few hours each um, morning in Pacific time. So it'd be sort of, you know, middle of the day, Eastern time um, from, from 9 a.m. to noon Pacific time on each of these three days. Um, the, some more news about that and the specific schedule will be coming out soon. Uh, it'll be on the www.nurse.gov webpage. We'll also uh, post something through email. Uh, yeah, so watch out for that. Um, but as a kind of a, a yeah, side effect follow on from that, since we're having the annual meeting in October, we won't do this monthly meeting in October. So the next no, monthly meeting will be in November. Uh, a little bit related. So a lot of the NUG activities are you know, planned out by NUGX, which is the NUG Executive Committee. Uh, and so this is a, a group of users um, selected to be uh, you know, as, as wide as possible uh, sampling of nurse users who you know, come together about once a month to uh, kind of oversee NUG activities that, you know, for, for the benefit of um, NERSC user community. So, you know, it does a, uh, a lot of looking into, you know, how, how can NERSC users kind of get more out of NERSC by you know, operating as a, as a community. And there's been some sort of yeah, good stuff happening in that this year. Um, and so, the way that NUGX operates is so we have a, you know, a, you know, a, a wide, as, you know, as wide as we can selection of users across all of the offices of science and in, you know, different uh, you know, career stages and uh, you know, areas of research and so on. Um, and uh, people serve on NUGX typically for, for two to three years. So that gives sort of a, a bit of uh, continuity. So each year we have, um, yeah, somewhere, somewhere between so, you know, half a dozen and 10 uh, NUGX members retiring and being replaced by new NUGX members. So we have uh, a mixture of uh, experienced NUGX uh, members and uh, you know, fresh views from other NERSC users on their, on their committee. So the, the, uh, the particular thing about this right now is that we're looking for nominations for the committee for next year. So we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, something like seven or eight of our current members retiring. So, so we're looking for another, you know, seven or eight people to, uh, you know, to represent nurse users. Um, you can nominate yourself or a colleague. So, you, so if you're interested in volunteering, you can definitely self-nominate. Also, if you know somebody who, you know, I think that person would, would be good to sort of get involved in this. Uh, you can nominate them too. We have a Google form for it. And you know, here's, the, here's, here's something on there, something I learned, um, I guess kind of earlier, but actually sort of did something with a little bit more recently is it's, it's really not that hard to generate a QR code out of a URL. And then when you're in a, a, a circumstance like this, where it's just a, a, you know, a shared Zoom screen and people can't just sort of click on the link, what you can do is put, point your camera at the QR code here and it will take you to the link. So we have a, a link to the nomination form and a, and a QR code about it. Or a QR code that you know, uh, corresponds to that link. So yes, please uh, yeah, uh, nominate or volunteer if uh, you're interested in that or you know somebody who you think would uh, yeah, be a, a good contributor. Uh, other important things sort of in flight and, and coming up. Uh, ERCAP allocation requests are open. They've been open for a few weeks now. Uh, they're due October 3, so another uh, two, two and a half weeks. Um, yeah, make sure you, you get those in. Perlmutter, uh, actually, I think Perlmutter's out today for a, for a maintenance, but uh, you will have noticed that Perlmutter Scratch has been unavailable. Um, and this announcement is actually already out of date as of uh, this morning. So, well, the, the maintenance is still ongoing. 
um, there's a there's a element of uh, physical maintenance, things being pulled out, new cards being put in, so part of the part of the update. Um, but Scratch is uh, after this maintenance going to be available again, but it's still undergoing maintenance, so it's not at full strength and has a a higher chance than normal of something breaking. And by breaking, that means you know Scratch suddenly becomes unavailable because of a a component failure. You know, in the in the normal course of operations, um, your components fail kind of all the time in a in a, you know, a, a somewhat statistically predictable way. And so we use uh, uh, redundancy as sort of one of the the big tools for protecting against that. So when something fails, it has a uh, a failover partner kind of in place ready to take its load. And because of the physical maintenance, uh, we don't have that full capability. So, so there's a higher chance that uh, you know, the file system might stop, but it will be available. And so uh, jobs will be able to use it, you know, Shift will be able to use it. Uh, and as the maintenance continues and you know, more and more of the, the pieces are updated, uh, that um, reliability and stability should improve. Um, Charging is still postponed. We're not going to start charging until Scratch is uh, solid. Will? So will it be read-write or read-only? Uh, it will be read-write. It will be full functionality, just not as robust and probably, um, you know, because components are being taken out, it means it's not at full, at full sort of strength. So, so you might see uh, performance not as good as usual until that update is completed. But yet, yeah, you'll be able to both read and write. And it's on both the login and compute nodes. Uh, there was an email out this morning about it. So you should be able to uh, check your email and get uh, yeah, a few more details. A uh, whole bunch of calls for participation out at the moment. So uh, LCF, that's Argon, is uh, doing a, a couple of workshops coming up. So there's a simulation data and learning workshop in October. October and a uh, intro to AI driven science uh, series. And both of those have a registration deadline of tomorrow. So if you're interested in those, uh, check the weekly email. It's got links to you know, how to get into it, or how, to, how to register. We have an upcoming training on uh, HPE Cray, uh, Perf tools and Reveal. These are actually really nice tools for sort of finding out what your code is doing and and you know, where you might be able to tweak it for better parallelism and, and better performance. This is where the list starts getting long. So we've got a, a VASP hands-on user training coming up at the end of September. Um, so we have a, you know, VASP is a, a pretty popular uh, software application used at NERSC. So if you are using VASP, you might be interested in that. Uh, there's a, a GPU hackathon being prepared. Um, there's a, a couple of them actually, one in particular happening at NERSC um, will be in November and December. The applications to join that are uh, due September 27. We have a new user training scheduled for September 28, so in a couple of weeks time. Uh, this is particularly good if uh, you, know, you just uh, you come back to the beginning of the, you know, the, the uh, college year, I guess and um, you're getting onto NERSC for the first time for a project. Uh, and, and it's also, yeah, got a lot of uh, good sort of tips and updates for more experienced users as well. Yeah, how to, how to connect and the, 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 the essentials of how to use NERSC facilities. Um, we have a total view training that was going to be today or yesterday, but it has been uh, moved because, um, yeah, uh, essentially waiting for uh, Perlmutter Scratch to be available. So that's now going to be September 29. The uh, Better Scientific Software Fellowship Program uh, has applications due at the end of September. So that's a, that's a really good program. Um, Supercheck, I'm pretty sure that's still accepting submissions. I don't recall the uh, the due date on those ones offhand, but so there's a look into um, yeah, MPI capable checkpointing and yeah, uh, discussions about checkpointing generally. Um, ESNet is the energy energy sciences 
um, network and NERSC is kind of a yeah an element of that along with a, a bunch of other facilities. So SNET is having their first annual meeting on, on October 12 and 13. Uh, the ideas ECP webinar. So this is a lot of um, you, uh, software engineering like tips aimed at scientific computing. Um, webinar on investing in code reviews for better research software in October. So that was quite a lot. These slides will be up on the web page, but uh, most of these things are in the weekly email and a couple of them are in separate emails as well. Uh, a few other things coming up is uh, we're planning a day to day and a, uh, a day of uh, case studies around um, preparing code for Perlmutter. So, you know, NISAP GPUs for science uh, coming in October. And I see Dan is online. Do you want to say some more, especially about the the day to day side of it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um... Oh, I think my that uh, doesn't really matter. <laughs> the wrong camera on, but uh, yeah. So day to day uh, is a reboot. I think the last day to day was 2018 or 2019. Um, so we're really excited to reboot this event, and it's actually going to be day to days. It's going to be a two day event in the end of October, uh, October 26th and 27th, I believe. Uh, so look for that in the weekly email, uh, the upcoming weekly email. There should be an event page and registration up for that. Uh, very soon. And it's going to be a really hands on event. We really want to be able to engage with users. Um, so there will be hacking sessions. There'll be opportunity to uh, share your data projects uh, in a quick lightning talk. Uh, and we will have kind of advanced and intermediary uh, or intermediate um, topics. Uh, so it should be a really great uh, learning opportunity. Um, we're going to try to make it accessible really to all levels of experience for users, but um, the topics are going to be kind of the latest and greatest things that we've been working on. So um, if you're interested, keep an eye out for that and uh, you should receive an announcement soon. Thanks, Dan. So I think that's all the ones that uh, I know about already. There are, I'm sure, a lot of other activities going on in the um, you know, nurse users uh, community. Any other announcements or calls for participation that nurse users uh, might be interested in that we haven't covered? No, we can go on to our, oops, next step, repeat slide here. Uh, so we can go into our topic of the day. Uh, Laurie will tell us about how to write a good ticket. So Laurie answers a lot of tickets. So she's seen some good ones and she's seen some bad ones. And uh, yeah, you know, sure. pretty well what, <laughs> what works best. Do you want to share screen or do you want to say next and I'll click it? Um, I can go ahead and share. Cool. All right. Okay, I'm gonna assume you all can see. I'm just gonna leave it in the slide mode. Um, yeah, so I know um, a lot of users really, when they submit tickets, they want us to help and they want help as quickly as we can give it to them because nobody wants to be stuck with the problem. But unless you've been in like a user facing role or you've done tech support, it can be kind of hard to know you know, what the people trying to solve your problem want to see or what's helpful for us. So just wanted to kind of give you guys a look behind the curtain and give you some tips um, to help get your tickets resolved quick, quickly. Um, so this this is a short talk, but I'm trying to cover um, all of the questions about tickets you were too afraid to ask. <laughs> um, and of course, I'm welcome. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, I don't know if I can really see if you raise hands or say anything in the chat, but maybe Steve can interrupt. Um, We'll cover some yeah. ticket myths versus facts. Sorry, Steve, was there? Uh... I was just saying, yep. I'll, oh, I'll okay, watch great. The chat and hands. Cool. 
Yeah, so uh, I came up with some myths maybe some of you might have. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of troubleshooting you can do, and I'll give you some do's and don'ts. That's probably the thing you care about most. So yeah, as I said, um, you probably want your question resolved as quickly as possible so you can get back to work. And from our point of view, we want to resolve it quickly too. Nobody wants to have a problem that just, you know, hangs on for weeks. So uh, hopefully what I can give you might help with that. Okay, we'll start out with uh, myths and facts. Um, so a myth might be that a nurse doesn't like answering tickets. Um, and I would say fact, uh, many of us work at nurse because we like helping people. Um, and it can be really satisfying to help solve somebody's technical problem. Um, so yeah, it's uh, most of the time, like we're very happy to help you. So don't, don't let that hold you back um, in deciding whether or not to submit a ticket. Um, another myth is I need to be an expert to submit a ticket. Um, and in fact, <laughs> any user can submit tickets. Beginner questions are very welcome. So if you're confused about what you think is something obvious or basic, like that's fine, just ask us. These, these are usually really easy for us to answer. So um, please, please don't hesitate. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay, another myth is uh, I need to have spent days troubleshooting something um, before I file this ticket. And fact is um, sometimes uh, it might be something that's really hard for you to figure out, but easy for us because we've seen it before. Or maybe we know that you know our scratch file system is hanging, but maybe the user may not know. So like for questions like this, um, it's, it might be more straightforward than you think. So. You know, it's not like as soon as you run into an error message, you know, start going to help.nurse.gov. But, you know, once you've done a little bit of basic troubleshooting and it's not obvious to you, like, go ahead and ask us. You know, you don't you don't need to waste your time or spin your wheels. OK, so before you uh, submit a ticket, there's a little bit of troubleshooting you can do, which might save you some time and, and help you figure out what's wrong before you ever need to talk to us. So. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this, but for anybody who's not, um, we have our nurse message of the day, the MOT D. So uh, we'll just go here. Um, yeah, so like if you tried to log in to Perlmutter this morning and couldn't, um, you might think, oh, there's something wrong with Perlmutter. But if you check the MOT D, it's like, oh, okay, um, the system is down for maintenance. So easy peasy, that answers that. Um, I will say sometimes if we're having trouble uh, with the system, like uh, it may not appear right away or, um, you know, like specific parts of the system, for example, the file system may not appear. So the MATI doesn't cover everything, but it will at least give you, you know, the, the basics, like is the system available? Um, I think a lot of you are on the NOG Slack that Steve mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a really good place to check in with your fellow users. You can paste, you know, the problem you're seeing. I know there's some staff there who can kind of weigh in, um, but this is a good community uh, to, you know, kind of see, you know, is there something wrong? Do other people see what you see? Other common things that we see happen. Um, if you're over quota, a lot of functionality um, will, you know, stop working. So you can quick just use the show quota command to check and make sure that you're not. Um, so this is pretty easy. Just type show quota and it will give you, you know, your usage on our various systems. So that's an easy thing to check. Um, another thing uh, is to go to our Iris webpage and make sure like, for example, um, have you run out of compute hours? Uh, hopefully you haven't, but this would be the place to figure out uh, if everything's okay account wise um and access wise okay so the the next thing to check are your dot files and uh, as somebody who answers a lot of python tickets i see dot files cause a lot of trouble for users um and this can be a problem because you might edit these files like five years ago and totally forget that you've added something and then suddenly it's a problem uh, but because you don't see it every day it's easy to forget that it's there so if you see weird behavior if suddenly um, you know something is working on Cori but not on Perlmutter, like just go ahead and sanity check um, your dot files. This uh, this is a common problem. Um, okay, so the last thing to try is you know check out our docs. 
uh, we have, I've got to enable the, uh, right, so we've got this nice little search bar. So for example, if you're seeing like a file locking error, um, you know, you might find this and this will help you, oh, okay, the error I saw is because I'm using, you know, that CDF on uh, a GPFS file system. So it, it won't always solve your problem, but the search bar uh, can be helpful. Okay, so you've tried all this, it doesn't help uh, your thing, whatever you're working on is not working. So it's time for a ticket. All right, so this, uh, in my opinion, these are some do's and don'ts um, for submitting um, a helpful ticket. Okay, um, please be specific. So if if your ticket uh, says something like my code is slow <laughs> or my job isn't starting or Corey is broken, um, which by the way, people do sometimes say, <laughs> it's really hard for us as uh, nurse staff to figure out first of all, what the issue is. And second of all, where we can start in terms of troubleshooting. Um, we're gonna have to answer back. Okay, can you give us more info? Do you have your scripts? Do you have job IDs? So on the right, these are some examples of like more specific um, descriptions of the problem. So in general, the more specific you can be, the better, um, and we won't have to go back and forth with you to get this information. Okay, next, I see this a lot. <laughs> uh, people just paste in the error message and they're like, you know what's wrong. So at NERSC, we have a lot of expertise. Um, we're pretty good at computers and we know our systems well, but the error message alone is usually not enough. Um, what did you do to cause it? What um, software were you using? What modules did you have loaded? So we're going to have to come back and ask you this stuff. So to speed things up, um, it'll go a lot better if you can please give us uh, more than just the error message. So do um, show your work. I know all of you have been through school and you would probably get marked off on some of your assignments, like uh, in math, especially if you arrive at the answer, but don't show how you got there. So it's the same for us. We wanna understand what is your thought process? What did you do? What did you try? What, what did your environment look like when you ran into the problem? So if you can give us like, you know, we can log in as you, we have the power to become all users. Tell me, you know, what the five commands are that I have to run to see the problem that you reported. So if you can give me that, you're giving me a lot of information about um, your setup and, and maybe what could be wrong here. If you're using like a custom software package, uh, maybe you could give us the link to the GitHub or something. Um, I know these things are really obvious to you because you use them every day, but for us, uh, it can be a little bit hard to figure out, you know, oh, which package is this? Where can I find it? Um, so basically the more you can give us, the better. And we, we do have a little docs page uh, that I discovered called how to write a good ticket. <laughs> so basically it says the same thing I'm saying here, give us, give us as much info um, as you can provide. Okay, don't, <laughs> please don't send screenshots. <laughs> um, this happens quite a bit too. Um, and the trouble with the screenshot is like, we cannot copy and paste from it. Sometimes you have really long complex paths that we're gonna have to look at and kind of type out manually, um, which can be uh, kind of hard and error prone. Um, we might want the path to log in as you and go look at the script. We might want the full traceback to try to paste into Stack Overflow and start trying to um, Google it. So we can't do this if it's a screenshot. And this also applies to pictures that you might have taken of your screen with your phone, which can sometimes be really hard to read in addition to not being copy pasteful. So please just give us the plain text, just dump it right into the ticket. It might look really long, um, that's fine. There's no, I don't know if we have a limit, but I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you're gonna hit it. So just dump the whole error message, um, it's, it's useful for us. Okay, so that's that's the end of my soapbox here. <laughs> so just to remind you, like uh, here at Nurse Guard, our job is to help you be productive on our systems. Um, and so that means if you're stuck, if whatever you're trying to do isn't working, um, please submit a ticket. It, it can be a beginner question. Um, that's fine. We're happy to answer that. Um, you know, don't don't waste a lot of time. We want to try to to help you and get you back to work. Um, 
to avoid having to go back and forth and ask and have us ask you, you know, to provide all this background information. If, if you can give it to us up front, that's awesome. Um, we can get to work and try to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, show your work. Please don't send screenshots. And um, yeah, then that way we can uh, we can help answer your questions. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah, a lot of uh, very helpful tips there. Uh, let's, uh... Okay. Um, I guess though, before moving on, are there any uh, questions? Uh, yes, I have. Mm. Well, it was quite interesting. Thank you so much, Ruby. I have actually made several questions, some of them out of curiosity. Uh, but first question is that, is there any way we can put those nice information up front in the ticket filing web page? Maybe just, you know, when we write the ticket on that website, maybe on top of the website, have you done those two, you know, few steps to remind us, like uh, uh, maybe link to MOTD or um, link to what I already forget, <laughs> some few steps that Laurie showed us to first try the five steps or something. And then also, if we could separate the box in a ticket form for maybe the context, for example, box for context or box for error messages that might can lead the users to write a good ticket sort of naturally. I try to provide the context to myself, but I often forget or if maybe not enough because of I'm a domain scientist. So some, yeah, some tweaks on the user form might be quite helpful for particularly for beginners, I think. But uh, yeah, thanks again for many, many uh, useful tips. I like that idea. So jotted that down. Um, yeah, I think we should we should look into whether we can uh, tweak that form a little bit to encourage you know, specific types of information in an easily findable way. Yeah, I like that too. Cool. Thanks again, Laurie, and thanks, Kochi, for the for the suggestion. So coming up, we're uh, we're actually running a, a little ahead of time this this month, which is uh, which is quite unusual. Um, Coming up next, we're always looking for upcoming topics. And yeah, here's another excuse to use a, a QR code generator. Uh, we've actually got a form. If you can, if you have a topic that you'd like to hear about, or better still, if you'd like to showcase some work that you're doing, this is a great opportunity to, to do it. Um, the, you know, the format is yeah, around about a 15 minute slot, you know, generally including a little bit of time for you know, Q&A and discussion afterwards. So it's not a, it's not a long presentation. Uh, it doesn't have to go too deep and a uh, you know, good way to uh, introduce users to, you know, to something that you're doing and you know, show off some, some great results. Yeah. And or if there are particular talks that or particular topics that you think would be good to hear about, uh, let us know about it. Uh, we have a, a form that you can uh, you know, nominate a topic and you know, possibly point to a presenter. And, uh, and that now it has a QR code on it too. So we've actually run a little ahead this month. Um, uh, I see a question just popped up in the chat. Does the search box search through all tickets or just the tickets with Rupert? I do not know, actually. I, to, I think it's yeah. just your repo. Hmm. 
I, I thought they were trying to make tickets public, but there's some uh, privacy concerns. Yeah, there's, there's um, definitely some limitations about some of them. Um, I think there is a checkbox that you can check that if, you know, if your ticket is something that can be public, uh, essentially if it's, if it's not something that's you know, directly about your specific account, is, is probably the main uh, consideration there. Then I think uh, in the form, there should be a checkbox that you can check and um, that you know, allows the ticket to be uh, included in a knowledge base. Question from Richard, what, what does the community think? If, uh, if the default was that everybody can view your tickets, would people feel, uh, yeah, would it, would it affect how comfortable you are with the ticket system? And with only a handful of us left, it might not be the right time to uh, to discuss that. But it's one to one to think about. Maybe a, a discussion topic for a, for a future meeting. So we'll wind up a little bit uh, early. Thank you all for joining us and. Uh, participating in the discussion and thanks again Laurie for those tips on tickets. Thanks everyone.